so this is taking the really excellent line list data provided by Ghana Health Service. Um, and these are the two main metropolitan areas where approximately 80% of cases in Ghana have been reported from. Uh, so Accra and its surrounding districts and Kumasi and its surrounding districts. Um, and you see that obviously the density of the cases is highest in the main metropolitan areas with then sort of dissemination out into the surrounding areas. On the right hand side, what you see are the individual area epidemic curves. Uh, and the we're still looking at this, but it appears that um, there may be different patterns. So for example, in um, Accra, cases go up first in Accra and then drift out into the surrounding regions, whereas there appears to be more contemporaneous um, spread from Kumasi into the surrounding um, areas of Ashanti. So suggesting that the transmission patterns or the mixing patterns may be uh, different in those areas. Um, this is to say, um, obviously, that we can convert these uh, case counts into um, estimates of what R has been at different points. And as you would expect, we estimated that R was above one as the first wave occurred, fell away during that lull in the summer, and then has uh, picked up again uh, into early 2021. We um, know that this may be affected by underreporting, so we are fitting some of our models to try and adjust for that. And again, what you see here uh, in the top left is that the line for Accra appears to spike first, and then the surrounding districts appear to follow slightly after, suggesting potentially transmission outwards from Accra, whereas um, in uh, Ashanti, the peak for Kumasi is obviously higher, but appears to be contemporaneous with the surrounding districts, suggesting potentially a different spatiotemporal pattern. Um, this, I think I may pass over just to say these are the sort of estimates of R for each individual region. Um, so, we, but we're really trying to work on how we deal with um, changes in underreporting, because obviously as testing has scaled up, that has varied significantly. Uh, and then finally, trying to um, fit some models to estimate what we think the real um, true age stratified um, uh, rates of transmission have been. Um, and I guess just the take home here is that the line in black is the reported number of cases based on the line list. Uh, and the line on the in red are sort of early predictions of what we think the true shape of the curve would be um, adjusting for detection or not detection of individuals based on both underreporting and obviously asymptomatic or subclinical cases. Um, and we hope that as we refine this model to Ghana more correctly, we will be able to more effectively evaluate how effective different interventions that the Ghana Health Service team have already rolled out are, and obviously use it to make projections with and without vaccination um, for the forward planning of the health service. Uh, final piece of modeling, just to say, we're looking at um, uh, the cases and the um, deaths that may be averted in the Ghana situation um, in the context of uh, vaccination. Um, Ghana was one of the first countries to receive vaccination through the COVAX uh, program and has had very high rollout of that already. Um, and we hope that we will be able to model, you know, that and assist in really evaluating its effectiveness. But this is very early work just to sort of give a sense of how we're hoping to bring some of these different streams of work together. Um, so in summary, I guess we hope that we'll get improved national real-time data collection to target enhanced surveillance in response to localized outbreaks um, and provide close to real-time assessment of interventions by government or at least assist the government in understanding to what extent different non-pharmaceutical interventions and eventually vaccination are having. Um, and uh, one of our principal investigators is actually got promoted during the course of the um, uh, grant process. So he went from being the head of uh, disease surveillance to now being the director of public health. Um, so it does mean we have a sort of hotline, although it's a hotline to someone who's now even more busy than um, he was when we started. Um, so with that, I'm going to finish and I'd really like to thank um, Professor William Ampofo uh, on the left and Franklin Azadeo Beku, who is now the director of public health and Ghana Health Service, um, who have really 
being key in, in delivering this uh, in Ghana. With that, I will finish. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Francine may, may proceed with Dr. Philip, or no, with Dr. Mathieu. Uh, hopefully, yes, he's connected. So uh, Dr. Mathieu Ndunga will present uh, the, some progress of his project, uh, ITAI, uh, COVID-19. So Dr. Ndunga, the floor is yours. So you, you must... Um, they mute your microphone and uh, Matthew, you are muted. Yes, hello, me, hello. Okay, uh, I think the presentation. Will uh, be uh, will be done by uh, by EDCTP or there is a shared screen. Uh, Let us share the screen, please. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry for. Ça passe pas. Non, non. C'est que c'est que c'est c'est bon. That's fine. Yes, that's fine, Mathieu. That's uh, fine. Dear professor, dear Francine. That's fine. Go ahead, please, with your presentation. Vas-y avec uh, la présentation. C'est bon. On voit. C'est bon. Can you hear me? Oui, oui. On entend très okay. bien. Yes. Okay, okay, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, sorry, really sorry. Uh, I'm Mathieu, Mathieu Ndunga, uh, coordinator of uh, ITAL COVID-19, the acronym of uh, Integrated Testing Approaches and Intensive Laboratory Training as Strategy Against SARS-CoV-2 Spread in Brazzaville. My presentation have uh, five points. An introduction on the second point of project partner on end objective, the work package of a project, the activity conducted, and the challenge. We have uh, some uh, three dates of uh, the project. Uh, first, in uh, 40 20. Uh, it's the notification of a first case of COVID in the Congo. In uh, the same uh, month, we have uh, a, a approval, uh, ethic approval and administrative authorization of uh, our project by the sanitary and uh, research authorities. From April 30, EFSA, through its Medical clinical, uh, uh, clinical and uh, research center support Laboratoire National of Santé Public in uh, SARS-CoV-2 screening in the Republic of Congo. Uh, our project has uh, uh, four uh, uh, partners. FCRM is the coordinator, is the coordinator and uh, the other partners are Bernard Nutsch Institute of Tropical Medicine, Institute de Recherche pour le Développement in France, Air Revolution World Labs Community Interest Company in Inti and uh, Coris Bioconcept in Belgium. Uh, the project ran from uh, May 20 to October 21. The main objective of uh, this project is to better understand the COVID infection epidemiology in Congo Brazzaville and to send the country's national surveillance system. There are three uh, specific objectives. The first is to determine the COVID-19 spread through semi-rural and uh, 
Urban Community Usine Standard Moléculaire Tessile, RTPCR, and Sequencing. The second is to validate an ultra sensitive diagnostic tool approach RTPCR and point of care antigenic rapid diagnostic test. The third is to implement serological tests in Congo Brazzaville to trace the spread of uh, the virus in the community. There are six work packages. The first is clinical study preparation, coordination, and execution with uh, sample collection conducted by FCRM. The second is to compare RT-PCR method versus the addition of uh, a poor sample preparation method to identify COVID SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there are two partners, FCRM and uh, IB, IRB for France. The third uh, work package is to the validation of rapid diagnostic tests for COVID-19 antigen with uh, uh, COVID uh, with rapid test diagnostic. The fourth uh, work package is zero epidemiology investigation with FCRM and uh, uh, BNI team M. We have dissemination, communication, and exploitation of the results. Uh, FCRM and the revolution are involved, and man management is the responsibility where FCRM is, uh, is responsible. Uh, activity conducted. In uh, work package one, SARS-CoV, the activity conducted is SARS-CoV-2 de de detection with RT-PCR test with uh, oral uh, or oropharyngeal swabs. Uh, from March 2 to January 21, we have uh, Let me set 35 screenings sample in uh, FCRM and uh, uh, 1152 SARS-CoV uh, positive sample positive. That is uh, 8.4 uh, positive samples. In Congo, uh, the last data collected uh, gives us. Uh, 104 to 366 persons with uh, 9,779 positive samples. Uh, that uh, is 8.8%. Uh, 8 uh, in the work package, uh, uh, we are all these uh, sequencing of uh, virus securing in Congo. We have uh, two, uh, two, two sequences, two, two times uh, we have uh, sequences uh, this virus in October 2, the first 11 sequences, and in December and uh, January, 42 sequences published in GIS, GSIS website. In our work package to compare the conventional ATPCR with uh, APOH, we had uh, uh, two uh, webinars two, uh, for protocol and uh, to conduct uh, activity in the laboratory. Since February uh, this year, we are in the process to of validation of the protocol of a, of a protocol in our laboratory. Uh, in the work package uh, three, validation of rapid diagnostic tests for COVID-19 antigen, we have uh, tested uh, uh, 4,038 positive samples, but only 31 were positive. This data indicates a low sensibility of, 
of uh, the of uh, this test, but uh, we continue to evaluate this uh, this rapid diagnostic and more than uh, one thousand of uh, tests of sample were tested. In zero epidemiologic investigation, uh, using the first activity is using zero logical rapid diagnostic test to determine herbal immunity in Congo, the Congo Brazil population. The data of uh, this activity will be uh, done, will be given by uh, uh, Bachi Doctor in the second communication of uh, our uh, institution. The second activity is performing serological ELISA on serum, serum samples collected for asymptomatic subjects. More than 1,000 samples from asymptomatic, asymptomatic persons living by the field were performed by ELISA in of IGG. Uh, and the percentage of, percentage of uh, person with IgG is 26.7%, while the carrier of SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus is only 3.7%. Uh, uh, for dissemination of uh, our results, we have many activity. The first is uh, the participation of uh, Professor to be in uh, the 25th section of Carrefour 4. Uh, he made a, a, a communication, rapid, rapid diagnostic test uh, serological data. Sorry. Uh, the second uh, activity, you make uh, the, a memo, uh, you, make, you prepare a, a memo and uh, you diffuse it into Congolese stakeholders uh, in September. We, we make and publish uh, Italian COVID first uh, press release in September. Uh, in December, we have the first publication in International Journal of Infectious Disease. But she also make uh, a, a communication in a, a congress, in a congress, a congress international of COVID-2 in Brazzaville in January uh, 21. Uh, Madame Le, Lille de Baloba make a communication uh, in a webinar, contribution the farm scientific d'Afrique Central dans la lutte contre le COVID-19 on February. In the same uh, webinar, Francine to me make a communication, uh, myth et réalité sur les variants du SARS-CoV-2, moyens disponibles pour traquer les variants dans la sous-région. In February, he publish our second press release. Uh, with uh, Web Package 6, we had a uh, uh, meeting, three meeting with uh, partners in June, September, and October. We prepare uh, activity of uh, our uh, consortium, and uh, in July, we, publish, we prepare and diffuse activity monitoring uh, sheets. Another uh, sheets on May and uh, January, the last uh, uh, activity monitoring sheet. Uh, you have uh, many challenge for our uh, for the running time of a project. In our package one, you must continue uh, to, to have genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 variants circulating in Congo. In our package two, you need to finalize the validation of 
approach some approach techniques. New way package three, you need to continue the validation of rapid diagnostic tests uh, using positive and negative uh, SARS-CoV-2 samples. Package uh, four, uh, you need to follow up rapid diagnostic uh, uh, patients uh, who have uh, RT-PCR uh, positive uh, for post infection and evaluate immune response over the time. And uh, with web package five, uh, you need to intensive the exploitation and the diffusion of uh, results. Sorry, uh, it was my presentation, and uh, you have uh, unfinished. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ndunga. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Akliliu, I think we, we are on time. Yes, yes, we are on time. Yes. yes. Uh, I, I will now call uh, the panelists, yeah. the three presenters, and uh, three more additional who haven't had a chance to present. I ask now the panelists to put on their video if they agree, and those who have not presented to introduce themselves and their consortia that they present. Uh, the panelists are uh, Sonia Enose, uh, 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 Linda Gale, Matthew, Michael Marx, and Annette Erhardt. Please proceed, those who have not presented to introduce themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sonia Nos. My name is Sonia Nos. Um, I'm a researcher at the National Institute of Health in Mozambique, and I'm a co-investigator in the Africa project uh, in Mozambique. So uh, can I continue? Or? Maybe. Okay. Yes, maybe I will continue with presenting uh, uh, the AfriCover project. So the AfriCover project is a project with uh, uh, the aim of uh, uh, understanding uh, the transmission parameters of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in Mozambique. Uh, how the epidemic is spreading, and also investigate risk factors uh, for infection and severe disease. It is a consortium of four institutions, uh, the Institute of Tropical Medicine, ITM of Belgium, who is responsible for the overall coordination, including scientific oversee of the project. We have the Institute National de Salud in Mozambique, uh, who is responsible for the implementation of the, 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 the project in an HDSS area that is being uh, managed by the Polana Caniso Health Research Center in, Mos in Maputo City. And we also have the Institute uh, the Research Polar Development, Friends, and the University of Medical Center, uh, Utrecht. So these are the four uh, institutions that uh, are part of the consortium in Mozambique, the Africova project. Thank you. So maybe we need uh, um, to, to Eleni, we need to point out that the panel, what will be the topic of the panel discussion huh? for all of you, it will be, the question is what is being done or should be done to ensure findings from your project are used by governments to strengthen surveillance and response strategies. Okay, so maybe yes. I don't, Yes, so uh, so what do, do you think, Eleni? We ask first all the presenters to introduce themselves and then we come back and each one will give 
uh, his view on this question. You're still on mute. Yes. Uh, for Ignacio Mando, 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 he's there. Yes, uh, uh, I'm here. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ignacio Mando Mando. So, I work for Manisa Health Research Center in Mozambique, the Manisa Foundation, and I'm coordinating the, the COVID surveillance in rural uh, uh, Mozambique for prompt uh, and effective response. So, this uh, project has as a partner National Institute of Health from one side of Mozambique and uh, IS Global in Spain and Imperial College of London. And we also have support from the uh, Institute for Biomedical Research in Valencia that will be dealing with sequencing of, of the virus. So basically uh, 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 our main uh, the aim is to understand the COVID epidemiology in Mozambique and also for looking at the dynamics of, of, of transmission. We had a, a, a five-work package, but to focus on the question, uh, what should be done in order to ensure that the government can use this? Uh, Maybe you will give your answer later. You, okay. you have Thank you. And you will come back to you with your answer. Great, thank you. Linda Gelbecker. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Linda. Oh, yeah. So, um, so, so in response to the question, we, we developed our protocol with the Department of Health here in the Western Cape. So um, we, we are also um, sourcing our, our index patients from, from the Department of Health, and we we regularly share those, um, those, those results with them. In terms of, um, of the response to the epidemic, one of the things that we, that we anticipated was that the lockdown here in South Africa might um, hamper um, access to healthcare. So, so one of the things we've, we've certainly experienced is our HIV services have been less frequented um, um, over the past year. Our, our lockdown was initiated on the 27th of March, uh, 2020. And so we've experienced um, folk have, have not been uh, visiting the diagnostic services. And certainly in the, the TRACE project, um, we found that, that um, folk have not uh, visited for their, for their chronic medication. Um, and, and so we're, we're going to be feeding that back. We've, we've, we've had um, feedback sessions with the Department of Health, but we also do intend to, um, to, to uh, uh, feed that back more formally and to, to then share that um, through, through manuscript. Thank you very much, Philip. So, Mathieu Ndunga, uh, do you want to introduce yourself shortly? Dr. Mathieu Ndunga? Bon, we will come back to him. Uh, Michael Marx, he's still with us. Michael, yeah. Hi, thank you. Yes. I, I think it's a really great question. Um, uh, oh, in you. keeping with the um, answer already given, I think, you know, you saw in our presentation, um, you know, that we're working very closely with Ghana Health Service and with Noguchi, who are one of the main testing labs. I think uh, a key lesson really is about not necessarily reinventing platforms. So, you know, trying to build, for example, on the flu surveillance platform uh, for COVID, I think it m makes a lot of sense in terms of building on existing healthcare uh, system structures. Um, and I think um, a willingness to do things which academics are not always that good at, which is abandon some lines of inquiry and um, introduce new ones if the questions that you raised when you originally thought about your grant are no longer the key questions um, for a health system. Um, so, you know, we were writing this grant application, I guess, almost a year ago now. Uh, and 
many countries are now in a different place with the COVAX program, with new variants. And so thinking about how our modeling or our sequencing questions, maybe we don't want to answer the question we originally said we would want to answer. We might still want to use the same set of tools, but you know, um, academically, it might be very nice to know what happened in March, April, May of 2020. But um, from a health systems perspective, it would be more useful if we can try as much as possible to, you know, shift our focus to answering the questions that are now relevant to the health system. So I think perpetually trying to keep on top of that is really key. Mark, uh, if I may ask, there is a question for you from the audience uh, that if you have any hypothesis about the reason for the seasonality observed with the two waves, the second starting in the beginning of 2021. And do you have any uh, hypothesis for this? Thank you. Is that question in the chat someone? I just can't see it. No, it comes to me. If you don't see it, I'm, I'm reading it to you. <laughs> so, so in keeping with many countries, for example, Ghana did introduce a number of non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions or lockdowns, I guess. Um, so there were, tr you know, the borders were closed for a prolonged period. There were travel restrictions for um, particularly Accra and Kumasi. Um, so we would imagine that those uh, interventions did have some impact. And I guess we hope that we will be able to unpick a little bit which of any of those interventions made a difference. Um, there may or may not be a seasonal element um, to coronavirus, you know, we know that there is a seasonal element to normal human coronavirus transmission. I think that um, is still really a bit less clear for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then, of course, um, although we've only got a small amount of sequence data, what you see in 2021 is these new variants of concern, which, you know, in many settings do appear to be associated with an increased risk of transmission, uh, and which might therefore well play into, um, you know, a second uh, wave of transmission. So I, my guess is it's multifactorial, including um, interventions from the Ghana Health Service, um, potentially seasonal variations and importation or emergence of more transmissible strains. We have one more panelist to introduce. Anit Erhardt from Covidas. Anit? You are muted, Francine. <laughs> no, I said uh, uh, she is muted. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Annette Erhardt. I'm a clinical uh, epidemiologist based at the MRC unit, the Gambia, and I'm coordinating uh, the COVADIS uh, study, which, uh, which stands for uh, COVID uh, diagnostics and uh, transmission uh, dynamics. And um, this is a, a consortium uh, between um, six partners. So beside the MRC unit, the Gambia, uh, we are also working with the IRSS CNRTS in uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, we are working with the Amsterdam Medical Centers in the Netherlands with uh, Coris Bioconcept who provides the uh, RDT, antigen-based RDT. And uh, we are working with uh, the team of Chris Drackley at the London School. And also uh, locally, uh, we are working with the Gambian uh, government represented by the National Public Health Laboratory. Thank you. Now we will ask uh, all the panelists to give uh, their precise and concise uh, response to the questions that you would like them to, to uh, discuss. What is being done or should be done to ensure findings from your projects are used by the government to strengthen the surveillance and response strategies? May we continue with from Annette, since you are already there? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, so in the Gambia, uh, what is done currently is that we are working directly with the NPHL, the National Public Health Laboratory, in uh, the screening of the COVID cases and also the contact tracing, quarantine. So this is, uh, I think, the best way to communicate directly the, the results of the study because yeah, we are working to get together on a daily basis. So any uh, deliverable from the project will go straight to, to uh, the uh, government and who can then uh, implement uh, changes. The other thing is that, for example, in our project, when we are testing a new antigen-based test, the question, the, the, the first question from the government is, how will we be able to implement this RDT? Will we get any kind of support to buy or to, to get access to these RDTs, given that in the commercially, they are commercially available, but the, the unit price is about $9 per, per piece. So that is another question. Uh, that we get often. And so after the test is being evaluated, the, the second question will be how will a local health system get access to these tools if they are proven performant? Uh, for this, uh, of course, the, we need to engage uh, the provider, but maybe also local partners who are working uh, like WHO or UNICEF, uh, Red Cross, if we can actually uh, get these tools at an accessible price for the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. Over to you. So uh, thank you. Maybe we go back to Mark, uh, to Africa Vert uh, first, because I think um, Philippe and uh, Michael Marx provided some answers. We will come back to them uh, later, maybe to go to Africa Vert, your response. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, in terms of what is being done uh, or should be done to ensure that the research findings are used by the government, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that we are working very close uh, with the Minister of Health, the National Directorate of Public Health, and also the local authorities uh, in order to ensure that uh, they use the results. We communicate to them the results. Uh, the Africa over household surveillance is already integrated into the public health uh, uh, report system. So all the samples we collect uh, uh, during the field work are introduced in, into DISA, which is the laboratory information system. And uh, the results are available to the health service uh, at, the at, the, at the same way the samples are collected in the field. Um, also, the participants receive, uh, receive their results and and they are being followed up with both the study team and the Maputo uh, city health sector authorities. Um, also at the INS, uh, we have a communication uh, uh, um, uh, directorate uh, for this Africa over and for the other studies also, we have a communication plan uh, to ensure that the results are communicated to the uh, uh, authorities. For instance, uh, uh, and for the zero epidemiological surveys that we did in the country, and it's going to be the same for this, uh, we had a communication plan and all the results were directly informed to the local authorities, informed to the Minister of Health, and the information also went to the, uh, 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 the public through presentations at, at the media, TV, radios, et cetera. And these results are also informed to the uh, uh, scientific, we have a COVID scientific committee. So these results are also informed to them so that uh, uh, they can use the results to uh, ensure uh, uh, that uh, uh, the prevention and control measures are, are, are informed by the results of the surveillance. We also have uh, uh, um, 
At the National Institute, we are responsible for testing at the national level and also for the surveillance. So there is a good communication between the different the, the directorates and the results from the, the, the health surveillance. So for the Africa Overhouse uh, 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 project, uh, we have a, a, a plan. Uh, we started already to communicate the results and we will continue to communicate uh, 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 further results. We also have this uh, uh, COVID scientific meetings. The next will be in July, in June, sorry, this year. So uh, uh, we plan to present our preliminary findings in that uh, 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 COVID-19 uh, uh, scientific meeting. Thank you. Oh. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> go, no, ahead. Please, go ahead, Francis. Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, anyway, thank you. So now we, um, for most COVID, Ignacio. Thank you uh, uh, again. So answering the specific question, uh, some of the uh, issues that I will raise here, Sonia already comment. So basically most COVID is happening in Manisa district, which is uh, around eight kilometers north to Maputo, the capital. And basically we, uh, we engage the local authorities and we have regular meetings with the local uh, health district authority and the local government where uh, we discuss uh, uh, the, the finding and the progress of the, uh, uh, the study. And through most COVID, we were able even to improve the testing capacity because the resource that were, the hospital was receiving for testing was not uh, able to cover the, uh, the demand that district had. But uh, through this most COVID, we were able as well to improve the testing capacity. And the data that is generated in Manisa district is also transmitted to the National Institute of Health and the Minister of Health through the DISA uh, laboratory system. So, and the follow-up of the patients are uh, being done uh, with the, the team of the, uh, the uh, National uh, 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 District Directorate of Health and as well the uh, uh, Manista Health Research Center. And as a consortium, we uh, also create the steering committee. And the steering committee is composed by National Institute of Health, National Directorate of Public Health, Minister of, of, of Health, where also we discuss the findings uh, from uh, 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 the, uh, the surveillance and we, we, we share uh, uh, with them for uh, prompt use. For example, uh, we are expecting to have the first results on the uh, sequencing. Uh, uh, as soon as this data is available, we'll also have the meeting with the National to see, to present what we have found, uh, what we have found this in in this surveillance, and as Sonia uh, uh, mentioned, there are some channels for communication and as well data sharing uh, with the Minister of Health and other uh, stakeholders. So, uh, for the Manisa community, uh, uh, we do have within this uh, project as well the. A community engagement a, 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 a work package where we also uh, discuss with the uh, with the community to know their awareness about the COVID, the transmission, the prevention, and all this information is used in order to see where we need to improve the message for preventing COVID. So these are some of the mechanisms that we have put in, in place for that specific study. Over to you. Shall we go now the next to um, Matthew Design Consortium? Uh, Dr. Mathieu, allo, Dr. Mathieu. Vous pouvez répondre à la question. 
Mais, allô Docteur Mathieu, vous pouvez répondre Bon. OK. Bon, anyway. Si... OK, we can go to uh, Philip to say something about uh, the trace. Consortium. Yeah. So... What is being done and what is needs to be done for yeah. so the suppose... government to use? One of the things that I that I didn't share in my in my previous share 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 in my previous and 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 shared with the Department of Health. So those those documents will find their way to um, to to facilities. And really, what it is 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 um, looking at how to manage um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 um, in the household. And um, and so so it helps uh, you know uh, folk in the community. And then you know some of what it addresses is is also you know some of the anxiety. Around um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the household, so those are all really um, shared in that uh, in that pack, and and has already been shared with um, with the Department of Health. Yeah, Philip, there was a question from the audience to you. How was your experience and during the implementation of your project? How was your project perceived by the community? Hmm. Yeah, so so the, the 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 person who asked that question said they they were experiencing difficulty in recruiting participants, and so the exact figure, um, something like we we had screened three hundred and fifty uh, two uh, referrals from the Department of Health, and of that we had ninety five um, uh, index patients who were willing to 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 participate. So that's you know that's lower than a, a 30 percent um, uptake of the of of the trace um, uh, 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 package, and so so some of that I mean we, we could say there were a few cases that that were related to stigma and and, and anxiety. So those those cases come to the mm -hmm. fore, but that's really a handful of cases. Um, and and for the others, you know, um, it's difficult to tell uh, what what the refusal was about. So you know, we tried to record refusal um, uh, for that, uh, but it's it's hard to to say, you know, uh, what the reasons were. Um, certainly, once they're in the study, we can we can then you know um, tell what that's about. But we experienced some of the same difficulties, um, and once. Uh, uh, patients were involved um, in the study. We also experienced intermittent um, um, in uh, wanting to be involved, more so in the last case. So, um, what I didn't say was was for for the um, um, for the initial initial visit at baseline. We gave the equivalent of of seven dollars. Um, uh, just eight dollars, uh, which is 150 rand for for participation, um, which really is, you know, it, it could be um, depending on 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 the household, uh, a meal for a household, um, and and then again at the last visit. So there was some, you know, motivation to to participate in that first and last visit. But what we found was that, that it was really quite intermittent where people were involved and certainly where, where people needed to work, um, they, uh, they, they were likely not to participate in those, in those middle visits. So very similar to, um, to the questioner, our experience. There is another question from the audience. Do you have any communication plan to, to the audience with a simple language and uh, tailored to, 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 to the public? Um, communication plan around anything in particular, was, was there anything mentioned there? Especially communicating your findings. 
to the government, yeah. to the audience, and to the community? Yeah, so, so uh, to the community, we, we started off by, by um, approaching the community and particularly through the community advisory board, we, we, we presented the study before we went off um, and, and initiated the study. We've had, we've had a midway presentation to, um, to the community um, to, to, to pretty much uh, give a similar update to, to what, we've, um, what we've given today. And then we will have uh, um, information dissemination with the community as well. Um, we're in constant uh, uh, communication with, um, with, with the Department of Health. Um, and then, then as well, you know, once, once we have our findings, those findings will be um, uh, written up. And, and we will also have um, our, our university um, presentation at the end. So we'll present those findings um, at, at the Department of Medicine here at the University of Cape Town. Thank you, Philip. You have any comment what should be done now for the future? Uh, just, just Professor Eleni, Dr. Ndunga is available. Just he has raised his hand. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I've, uh... A well, question uh, uh, on the sensibility of uh, antigen therapy uh, tests. We, we continue to test uh, to, to evaluate these uh, uh, these therapy uh, tests, but I, uh, you see in the presentation, you have a few positive positive samples who give a give uh, give positivity with uh, with uh, this. Uh, uh, rapid diagnostic test. We think uh, that the, the sensibility of uh, this uh, uh, this rapid is very low, but we continue we, to test negative uh, rapid uh, RT PCR positive sample as uh, positive uh, positive and negative rapid diagnostic uh, rapid. RTPCA uh, samples because we have many, many, a lot, an, an important lot of these, uh, uh, these devices. Uh, Dr. Mbunga, uh, sorry, the question uh, asked by uh, uh, Professor yeah. Eleni, what, be, what is being done or should be done to ensure findings from your project? Qu'est-ce qui est fait ou qu'est-ce que devrait être fait pour que le gouvernement euh, s'approprie les résultats du projet? Oui, oui, we have, uh, we have made, uh, made a memo to political makers uh, in uh, many websites. We have diffused the press release. I think many purpose now uh, now uh, activity of uh, our project. We have fait des memos, we have fait des communiqués de presse, déjà deux communiqués de presse uh, uh, qui à travers le, le monde on our website. Donc, uh, je crois le gouvernement a gouverné nos our activity. Uh, plus encore. Our project is linked with the uh, Laboratoire National uh, for the, notre test, notre, nos activités sont liées au, 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 au Laboratoire National de Santé Publique. Donc, le, le ministère de la Santé connaît nos résultats. Our ministry, if the ministry knows our activity because we have a second center who has the, we have the possibility to make RT-PCR on uh, uh, COVID samples. So if I may uh, help you, it's just that, okay, your institution is working in close collaboration with the National Reference Laboratory 
story in Congo, and also uh, your lab is involved in the national uh, COVID-19 testing. So you have uh, you. It's easy for you. Uh, this facilitates the communication with the national uh, uh, stakeholders, including the Ministry of Public Health. So, Prof. Elen Professor Eleni, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francine. That was very uh, clear. So, we continue with the others who had no chance to say from the panelists. Oh, hi, uh, can I? Yes, please. Yes, uh, uh, just to add, uh, I didn't mention that, uh, but to, uh, at the Africova project, we also have uh, uh, a community advisor board uh, that works uh, very closely with us at the center. And uh, uh, at the beginning of the study, we had meetings with them and they uh, helping also with the meetings and the community. And they also help uh, 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 with mitigation of rumors. Uh, sometimes it's difficult for the population to understand the surveillance, what is going on. So they're helping us with uh, uh, communicating with the community and give the results. In terms of what should be done, uh, uh, I think we should continue with our our communication uh, uh, plan. Uh, we have the communication plan and whenever we have uh, 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 the results, discuss with the local authorities, discuss the results uh, among the different consortiums and take these results uh, 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 to the uh, uh, stakeholders and the Minister of Health and the local authorities uh, so that they can be used to strengthen uh, surveillance and the prevention and control of uh, 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 the disease. Thank you. Sonia, how was your experience when you were implementing your study in the community? Did you have a big challenge like, like Philip? We started the implementation of the surveillance in December 2020. This is a community where we've been working on uh, uh, for a long time. We have a, a health demographic uh, surveillance system. And uh, 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 it, it's not difficult to work with the community, but of course there are some issues. I mentioned uh, uh, here the need of working with the community advisor board, uh, but we have been able to, to, to manage some of the challenges that the community working with this community advisor board. Uh, some of the main challenge were for the uh, community to understand exactly what is the surveillance. Uh, some, because sometimes there, there were some rumors or what they, are they bringing uh, uh, more COVID, are they bringing vaccines to us? Uh, so we had to work with them in order to make sure that they understand the objective of the, the, the study. And we are now continuing with the surveillance. Yes. Yeah, it will be a big challenge now with the stigma and also with the rumors. Uh, so get participants in, in most studies. And we communication planning, engaging the community leaders. Uh, that will be very good to, to, to use, really. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, if I may ask all the panelists, if all of them are conducting genomic surveillance and if it's easy for them to, to, to provide this information to national stakeholders and how they consider these results. Do they endorse them or they are skeptical? So how, how does uh, it is managed? So maybe we, we start Africover Afri and the others. Africover? Mm -hmm. Hello? 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 Mix surveillance. Or Ignacio, Ignacio from Mozambique. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you. So, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, uh, in terms of genomic surveillance, in fact, is uh, it is part of one of our work package. 
and because we believe that this information is relevant for the project and also for generating data that can be in need of other vaccines, for example, because we know that knowing the strain circulating is clearly relevant for appropriate design of a vaccine that can have a, 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 a broader coverage. As we, we witness, a, 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 some of the vaccines are showing less efficacy against a, some variants like South African variants. So we do believe that the data generated in this, at least in Mozambique, will be well received by the a, a Minister of Health and other stakeholders. So for our surveillance now, we have sent a, 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 a samples to, uh, to Spain for sequencing. And as soon we got the result, we will share with the Minister uh, of Health what is circulating in Mozambique, in, in, in Manisa, the catchment area. Thank you. Thank you, that's interesting. And I think uh, Dr. Ndunga, for Congo, uh, also, uh, quelle est la situation de la, de la surveillance génomique? Oui, euh, merci, thank you. Euh, euh, les échantillons simples pour le Congo ont été séquestrés à tout temps en Allemagne in Tübingen, but uh, this time uh, there are no specific, special uh, uh, variants like uh, uh, South Africa variants, uh, uh, the variant for Grand Bretagne or other country. Uh, what I know that there are uh, some variants from FDC, but uh, not uh, that uh, no, do not influence the pathology in our, uh, our, our pays. I think it's an important point because uh, the capacity of sequencing in our Central Africa is very low. Uh, we have the chance with collaborator with Tiringa to have the possibility to sequence, to sequence uh, some uh, a sample, some positive sample. Uh, okay. uh, Thank, Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Eleni, if you note that you note that Mozambique and Congo they send samples to you know outside Africa for sequencing. So uh, well, for South Africa, I'm sure they do that, they do yeah. <laughs> sequencing there, but that's interesting and also for EDCTP. So to see that that's important to strengthen, you know, that's true. sequencing local platform. Capacity. <laughs> that's very important. Okay. There is a question I, I, from... I, I can, if, if you allow me, I would like to comment on that in 10 seconds, for example. For sure. our specific case, the way it, it, we are sending to Europe because this is one of the partner of the consortium. So, but what we are also considering as a, 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 a Manisa Research Health is also once this grant is over, so we want to continue with genomic surveillance and we are already exploring some collaboration within the country. But this was specifically because one of the partner has the facility for, or for sequence. And probably it, it, by, by the end of this grant, a, a Manisa also will have a capacity because we, a, we were awarded grant from Gates Foundation in, in order to establish a, a, a genomic a, 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 a sequencing in, a, a, in the context of malaria project that can be extended to other, uh, a, 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 to other uh, diseases as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Indosio. That was a very good uh, comment. Uh, uh, there is one question from the audience for uh, Dr. Nodunga. What about the specificity of the AGRDT? Was there any record of cross-reacting antibodies? Dr. Ndunga, 
quelle est la spécificité des tests antigéniques actuellement et est-ce qu'il y a des possibilités de réactions croisées euh, autre, I can say that the specificity is very low, uh, considering the, the, fact, the, the first result we have. Uh, cependant, nous continuons à, à tester sur des centaines plus. Uh, nous continuons à tester, et puis le data manager va nous. Uh, Uh, data manager will we uh, evaluate our results. But the first, the first uh, uh, constatation is the sensibility is very low because on plus de 300, 400 échantillons, only 31 were positive. It's uh, very, uh, uh, it's not. Uh, on my point of view, it's not very good to use this, uh, to this in the, not, uh, many in the, uh, the screening of uh, the population. I don't know what, uh, <laughs> if other country, other sets is using this, uh, this uh, device. I don't know. But my point of view is, is the sensibility is low, is low. But there's no problem of and, specificity. And, uh, à propos de réaction croisée, nous n'avons pas, we have not idea about the crossing uh, reaction uh, of antibodies. Thank you. So this, uh, this has to be explored. Yes, yes thank you. There is one, uh, we have only one minute left. Uh, there was, of course, a question from the audience about the database. Do we, we are now doing surveillance, uh, including the genomics. Do we have a database for Africa? Because now we are involved in whole genome sequencing, which we are going to think about and how to share data. This is very important. So, Francine, just Hello, uh, we you? have a take home message that we should say from this. Now we have only Fine, one. Thank yep. you. I actually just sent you an email about it, but did you um, phone me because I phoned you? <laughs> Kirsty, you need to mute. Francine, you are muted. <laughs> okay. Oh, a take home message is that uh, I see that all these projects projects are really working in close collaboration with the, the national uh, reference laboratory in their country they are good communication plans what i they, they are engaged in uh, interaction with the local uh, with the communities and uh, yeah but as you mentioned for the data sharing locally it seems in place but um, between the different partners, how it works, this should be yeah, uh, also uh, considered uh, carefully. I mean, but I think this COVID-19 is for me is a really a good opportunity, really, for data sharing, for putting in place all the necessary tools for data sharing, procedures sharing, and uh, all knowledge sharing. So, and what I see in all these projects is really, uh, yeah, very strong consortia and working uh, well together with clear specific role and uh, yeah, and contribution. So that's. That's very great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just uh, a, a summary take home message that our, our uh, the projects are doing well. And there is a regular meeting to communicate with the government and the public health program and with the local community, especially involving the community leaders and advisors to tackle the stigma and participation. This is being done to be done is continuous with communication and result dissemination and not only to the national, but the international stakeholders, including public health, and most importantly, to increase the capacity for genomic surveillance in Africa. And with this, I thank every participant and the audience. And now we are breaking uh, 
breaking session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye from my side.
So, um, dear participants, we begin session two now, and I welcome you back from the break. Uh, session two is going to focus on special populations, and I'll be chairing this session. I want to introduce myself. My name is Juliet Nabionga Orem, and I work for the World Health Organization, Africa Regional Office. My area is health system strengthening, and now I'm focusing on health financing and investment where I head that program within the WHO African region. My research is in the area of health systems, and I focus more on implementation research. So um, in this session that focuses on special populations, we are going to have uh, three presentations, and then we'll have uh, a panel discussion after that. Again, I want to remind you to please keep the discussion going on the Q and A window, and we'll be uh, bringing up those questions for discussion on the floor. A few of them, although many of them could be answered on that platform, but we'll be raising a few of those that uh, really require a, a discussion uh, on a higher, involving all of us. So um, allow me to introduce the first speaker who is Katsi. Katsi works with uh, St. George's Hospital Medical School in the United Kingdom. And uh, here she's uh, representing the Pericovid Africa Research Consortium. And uh, she'll be speaking to us on understanding COVID-19 infections in pregnant women and their babies in Uganda, Kenya, Malawi, the Gambia, and Mozambique. So Katsi, you have 15 minutes, but I will allow you just one minute to talk briefly about what the consortium does. And then you take it from there, you proceed with your presentation for 15 minutes. So Katsi, over to your place. Thank you very much, um, Juliet, um, and nice to see everybody. Um, not quite sure why that is sharing the wrong screen. Um, my name's Kirsty Ladoire. Um, although I am um, from St George's University of London, I actually live and work in Uganda where I've been seconded to the Medical Research Council and the Uganda Virus Institute since 2018. Um, and as Juliet says, I'm here representing about 120 scientists from the Pericovid Consortium across seven countries in, um, on the continent of Africa who are working to understand um, COVID transmission and seroepidemiology in pregnancy and the neonatal period. Um, and it's a large group of epidemiologists and immunologists trying to answer these questions. So, okay. Um, so Pericovid Africa um, is primarily looking at seroepidemiology of um, COVID-19 infection amongst um, pregnant women um, across the continent um, and also looking to understand risks and routes of mother to child transmission. Um, originally, it was thought that um, women were at no higher risk of COVID-19 infection than their non-pregnant counterparts. But um, data is beginning to emerge that in a few cases, um, women can be um, very severely affected. Um, so our secondary objectives were to determine the clinical course and pregnancy outcomes for women um, infected with SARS-CoV-2 during their pregnancies and to determine the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 um, in various body fluids to try and um, unpick a little bit more about the roots of transmission. Um, we also wanted to assess the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 in pregnant women and their babies, looking at placental transmission, and most importantly, really, to work with the communities um, that we serve to understand their perceptions around infection prevention and control during the pandemic in pregnancy, um, and to try and reduce the spread of COVID-19 amongst the pregnant population. Um, so, as I've already said, um, there are several countries involved, so actively participating in recruitment are Uganda, Kenya, Mozambique, Malawi and the Gambia, which is our West African um, partner. Um, we're also receiving data from South Africa, who are doing their own um, trials um, in similar populations as part of two large consortia. 
Um, so Uganda, Malawi and South Africa are part of the PREPARE partnership, which is looking at neonatal infection with group B streptococcus, whilst the Gambia, Kenya and Mozambique are part of the PRECISE consortium, which seeks to look at the pregnancy big five um, outcomes, um, air quality and the environment um, on pregnant women. Um, the cohort itself um, is over 100,000 pregnant women across these different countries. So in terms of um, the focus area, the, what we are attempting to do um, is to align really closely with both, with all of the different protocols of the different consortium partners. Um, so as, I, as I've said, prepare and precise, we're also joined by the Bambi study from Malawi and COMAC, um, which brings in another four sites in Uganda. Um, we're also aligned with the WHO generic protocol for um, pregnancy and neonatal um, seroepidemiology and transmission to try and really make the, um, the most of this data in terms of informing policy um, and guidelines to protect healthcare workers dealing with pregnant women and also the pregnant women and the babies themselves. So at enrolment, um, which is the first antenatal contact that our study team have, um, all mothers um, have a throat swab um, and a, a blood sample looking for IgM and IgG against the coronavirus. Um, women are then randomized into um, three groups, um, COVID um, PCR positive, COVID PCR negative, antibody positive, and COVID PCR negative, antibody negative. Um, at delivery, we um, take a nasal swab from all of the infants for um, PCR after birth and some cord blood sample. If the mother belongs to the, um, double the double negative or the asymptomatic group, there's no further follow-up for either mother or baby at that point. However, if the um, mother is positive, um, further samples are taken, including placental, placental swabs and biopsies, depending on the site, vaginal swabs, urine um, and rectal swabs um, for PCR. Um, and these swabs, these samples in, and some breast milk are also taken at six weeks um, postpartum. Um, and we also take an infant heel prick looking for antibody kinetics. All of this um, is embedded within a large and ongoing community um, public patient involvement uh, exercise, engagement exercise. Um, through our um, social sciences and qualitative research teams to try and build capacity and strengthen um, recognition and understanding of the um, coronavirus. And now also with the rollout of the vaccines in many of the countries, um, building on that um, rapport that we have with the public to try and um, incorporate vaccination into, um, into our study. Um, in terms of our preliminary findings, um, we've recruited over 4,000 women into um, the study from the different cohorts. Um, what we have found is that there is very little symptomatic COVID-19 infection in pregnant women in any of our countries. Um, we've had only seven hospitalizations out of 4,000 women and no deaths, no infected babies at all. The biggest um, a barrier to um, entering the study that we have found actually is um, fear, mistrust and stigma around the testing for coronavirus itself in many of our sites. Um, and in fact, it's only the three um, COMAC study sites where this has not been an issue. Um, several sites have had to shut down completely because of either negative press or um, community not wishing to attend sites because of the study ongoing. We have, however, had an awful lot of our staff who have contracted coronavirus, which um, demonstrates the vulnerability of healthcare workers in all of our settings. And this has led to some staffing issues. However, despite that, I think you'll agree that we've recruited fantastic numbers um, and hats off to all of the study leads, at all of the sites for that. Um, I picture here um, the first of our um, uh, antibody um, samples, I wanted to get some data ready to prepare for, the, for this talk. What we are seeing is good immune responses across the placenta. Um, however, there is a differential transfer between the N and the antibodies against the N and the S um, proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and here in this diagram, you see um, the log titer 
of the either the neutralization or of the ELISA antibody for the different tests you see there on the right hand side um, compared to a complement deposition um, assay on the X axis. Um, and perhaps as you would expect, the total antibody ELISAs, so the Roche S and the Roche N ELISAs, do not perform particularly well um, with cord blood samples. Um, which probably reflects the, um, the fact that um, these um, uh, only IgG is cross, crosses the placenta and these assays measure the total antibody. Um, and actually none of these assays perform particularly well compared to neutralization, which is of a concern now that we're moving towards vaccination. And it will be really interesting now that our healthcare workers um, are beginning to be vaccinated and may also become pregnant, whether some of the antibody responses that we see might also be reflected in that. Um, and finally, um, we've been very fortunate um, that the team have been particularly um, busy in starting to publish um, overviews and calls to arms for um, pregnant and lactating women and their infants across um, the globe. Um, and Melanie Etty, who is the um, clinical fellow from Cameroon who has been leading um, the pericovid study, um, has actually published um, two very uh, good overviews of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection um, in pregnant women and their newborns, a systematic review and a letter to the editor, um, and also a call to arms for the inclusion of pregnant women in COVID vaccine development, um, and inclusion also in the rollout um, with really strict safety monitoring. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all of the team um, across all of the different countries, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Katsi, and really thank you for managing your time very well. So we'll go on to the next presenter. The, our next presenter is uh, Julie. Uh, Julie is from the King's College, London, and uh, she's representing the COVA Consortium. She'll speak to us about investigating COVID-19 infectiousness and antibody evolution in COVID-19 patients in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Europe. So. Uh, Julie, please talk briefly about your consortium in one minute, and then you proceed to make your presentation, and you have 15 minutes. The floor is yours. Hello, do we have Julie? Hello, do you hear me? Oh, well, um, I, I don't know, maybe we're going to the next presenter. Uh, let's go to Till. Uh, Till um, is from the uh, from the University of Heidelberg in Germany, and he represents the, uh, the Core Consortium. Uh, Till will talk to us about determining the epidemiological parameters for COVID-19 through seroprevalence and red plasma spots, and nested household transmission studies in rural Kenya and South Africa. So, so Till, I'd request you to spend the first one minute talking about the work of your consortium, and then for the next 15 minutes, please uh, make your presentation uh, till the floor is yours. Well, yeah, Juliet, thank you. Um, I am actually presenting jointly with Joy Mauti, who is our project lead on this project. And I must admit, I thought I'm on at um, 3.30. So now I need to pull up my presentation, <laughs> but I'll be very, very fast doing that. Um, here it is, final version, okay. Bear with me one second. And now if you could please confirm that you can actually see my screen. Uh, yes, it's coming, uh, yes, please go on. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so Joy and I sent the first half and then Joy who's leading on the Heidelberg side will 
present the second half. Um, it's a big team and um, it's a partnership between Aga Khan University in Kenya, um, WITS University, the Reproductive Health um, Research um, Institute unit at WITS and um, Heidelberg Institute of Global Health at Germany's oldest university, Heidelberg University. And you see all the names of our collaborators here. I have highlighted the PIs. In Kenya, it is Gloria Maimela and um, Stanley Luchters. At um, WITS, it's Eunice Irungu and Kat Catherine Martin and Matthew Chursic. And at Heidelberg, also Ellen van der Mel. And then we have additional wonderful colleagues in Australia and at the University of Washington who are doing um, particular um, technical pieces in this overall project um, that we needed, if you will, to buy in from particular methods experts. So our overarching aims are threefold. We want to define the epidemiological parameters of COVID-19 infection in rural Kenya and South Africa, including those that you would imagine are not transmissibility, clinical disease spectrum, population level incidence. This is a longitudinal project. And we also want to measure, quantify the burden of COVID-19 disease and risk factors for infection and transmission. And lastly, we have a, um, if you will, public health methods aim where we are assessing diagnostic performance, feasibility, usability in human centered design studies and cost effectiveness in a economics evaluation studies of um, alternative ways to collect samples and um, to approach people in the community and motivate participation. This has grown a bit since we first wrote this. We have uh, some more variation here in the approach to elicit consent and motivate people to participate in population-based um, longitudinal dynamic research. Um, these are the two places, South Africa and um, Kenya um, and you yeah, will know these places and I have here um, circled in red where we work and then highlighted in um, the two um, counties where we work, um, Kaloleni and Rabai. Um, I've switched here, as you can see, the naming of the countries, apologies for that. It is first Kenya and then South Africa on the right hand side. Um, so we have here um, in the study populations um, confirmed NHLS, that's for the South African case, um, the confirmed COVID-19 cases. We have consenting household members, 15 to 20 households, 120 participants in South Africa. And um, the cases in the South African sub-study will be contacted telephonically and invited to participate, of course, informed consent, primary cases, household cases, parents or guardians. And um, we do um, include children in this um, population-based survey. Um, NHLS is the National Health Laboratory System in South Africa, which is a starting point for the South African sub-study. Um, and we are here um, working with household contacts and following them up for um, day one up to day 28 um, for repeated specimen collection after enrollment. Um, we administer a questionnaire focused on a range of COVID-19 related um, questions and underlying hypothesis from theory and the extant literature potential um, risk factors. We also ask um, these COVID-19 patients in the South African sub-study to report in symptom diaries um, for 28 days um, their symptoms and their lives and um, how they're going about their livelihoods and also social aspects and how those change. Um, of course, we offer um, in this high prevalence area for HIV, HIV testing and counseling as an additional offering as part of this study. Um, we have also included molecular and ser serology assessments. These are being done at the Burnett Institute in Melbourne, Australia, and um, household members of COVID-19 contact index cases will be, um, in a sense, um, molecularly and serologically assessed at day 1, 7, 14, and 27. Um, in children, we do DBS as well in serum samples, um, including under 12 years of age and um, antibody testing. And then we take respiratory samples 
um, with molecular PCR for SARS-CoV-2. Joy, can I hand over to you for the second part? Yes, please. Thank you very much. So I continue from this, this continue with the study method. So um, the specimen we need will be collected at the household. And if it, this is not possible, the patients will be transported to the nearest facility where the study team will collect the specimens. And the laboratory testing will be undertaken uh, in South Africa by the Bach Laboratories and by Camry in Kenya. So uh, there, there will be full PPEs provided for the entire study team. Uh, should I share my screen or the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, our study um, data will be collected using the Go data tool and it will be stored in the Red Cup database. And this uh, data that has been collected will be used to calculate the length of the period of transmi transmissibility. And it will also be used to calculate the reproductive number. We are also going to investigate the disease spectrum, especially the rates of the asymptomatic infections. And we're also looking at the risk groups for the infections and for the disease. We also intend to estimate the understanding and implementation of the very prevalent uh, preventative behaviors. Also with the ongoing questions about the vaccines, uh, we will use this data to estimate the potential of vaccine uptake and assistance in both uh, Kenya and South Africa in the rural areas. So we have achieved uh, uh, a few, uh, some milestones, so especially in obtaining of the ethical approval uh, and also the research permits at the national and local level in Kenya, uh, in South Africa, in Germany, and in Kenya. And we also have established the laboratory teams, the data management teams, as well as recruiting and training of the study teams over the period of time. And we are in the process of establishing the community advisory boards, which will be done by the end of this month. And we are also preparing to prepare published the study protocol uh, from the Kenyan side. And we, uh, we already started on developing our statistical analysis plan. And for both sites in Kenya and South Africa, we, we are set to start our field work from the beginning of next month. So something significant is that we've been incorporated in the WHO unity studies. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. So the WHO Unity Studies is a global seroepidemiological standardization initiative, which aims to increase the evidence based of, of knowledge action. And uh, the Unity Studies promote standardized um, epidemiological molecular and all other methods. And it, the main aim is to facilitate um, uh, the comparisons between uh, countries and also to address the knowledge gaps and inform the evidence based co for COVID-19 response. And as such, the WHO unity studies are being considered as a valuable tool for research equity. So they have various uh, proposals and uh, for the COREP study, we've aligned with two proposals. So the first one is on household transmission and investigation protocol for coronavirus disease. And our main objective, the main objectives are to better understand the extent of transmission within the household and by estimating the secondary infection rate for household contacts at individual level and factors associated with any variations in the secondary infection. And also to characterize the secondary cases, including the range of clinical presentation risk factors for infection and the extent and function of asymptomatic infections. The third objective is to characterize serologic response following confirmed COVID-19 infections. So that is for the first protocol. And the second protocol is on population-based age stratified seroepidemiological investigation protocol for COVID-19 infection. And the primary objective is to measure the seroprevalence of antibodies to COVID-19 in the general population by sex and age group and in order to ascertain the cumulative population immunity, and also to estimate the fraction of asymptomatic 
pre-symptomatic and subclinical infections in the populations by sex and age group. So for the second uh, uh, protocol, there is a secondary objective, which is to determine risk factors for infections by comparing the exposures of infected and non-infected individuals, and to also contribute to determining the case fatality ratio and to contribute to an improved understanding of antibody kinetics following the COVID-19 infection. So there is a potential to align with a third protocol, but it's still under discussion, and this will address the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Okay. So we want to appreciate our teams. Uh, so these are the teams from Kenya. We have uh, Professor Stanley Luchas, who is our PI from the Kenyan team, and Eunice Irungu, who is the study coordinator, together with Anthony Claire, and then among others. And for the South African team, we have Gloria and Catherine who are our PIs, uh, together with Matthew, Wode, Emily Shabna, and Kukuleko, among others. And we also have another uh, other partners whom we want to appreciate. That is the IS Global, uh, the Barnett Institute, the University of Witwatersrand, uh, the Kilifi County government in Kenya and the University of Washington. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let's move on to our third presentation. Uh, Julie is joined us, she's in the meeting now. Uh, Julie is from the King's College London and uh, she's representing the COVAP uh, consortium. She's going to speak to us about investigating COVID-19 infectiousness and antibody evolution in COVID-19 patients in Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe. So Julie, talk briefly about the work of your consortium and then you go on to make your presentation and you have 15 minutes. And I would request if possible to turn on your video as you make your presentation. Over to you, thank you. Hello everyone. Sorry, I'm late to join. Um, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. I'm speaking on behalf of COVAB, which is investigating COVID infectiousness and antibody evolution in COVID patients in Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe. So our overall aim is to gain understanding about natural antibody and mucosal responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we're actually building on capacity development in EDCTP funded programs in HIV prevention. We've got three main objectives. The first is to understand- Sorry, Julie, let me interrupt you. Can you give us a slideshow? Because you have two slides on the screen and the font is so small. Is that okay? Okay, if you can make it bigger, that would be better, but if not, perhaps you carry on. Mm, no, I don't think I can, I'm very sorry. Please carry on. Okay, thank you. So the first work package is led by Mike Malam, um, and he's investigating antibody evolution in the UK and Uganda and is going to characterize the quality, phenotype, and evolution and durability of antibodies. And secondly, determine the effect of previous seasonal coronavirus species on SARS-CoV-2 disease severity and clone SARS-CoV-2 spike human monoclonal antibodies with potent virus neutralizing capabilities. The second objective is based in South Africa, led by Neil Martinson, and we're developing an ex vivo challenge model using oral and nasal tissue to determine risk factors for SARS-CoV-2 acquisition. And sorry, in Julie, sorry to interrupt you again. Somebody suggests that you can do it on display settings. I can't see displays settings. Okay. Sorry, that's, that's okay. I think let's go on, please. Julie, it's, sorry, it's just straight above the slide. 
So you have show taskbar display settings. Can you see that? Show taskbar, yeah. Next to it is display settings. I don't have the other way. No, mute. Stop with. Ah. Never mind. Very sorry, everyone. Um, and then the third objective we have is a social science work package led by Janet Seeley, which is developing understanding from communities to develop information tools and engagement for future COVID trials in rural communities. And in our case, it's in Uganda. So I'm going to give an update for each work package now. The first work package, we're going to analyse longitudinal blood samples from cases in, UK, in the UK and Uganda. And we're going to share lab methods and develop capacity in both sites to examine antibody responses and clone and characterise human SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibodies. To date, we have analysed all the UK samples, which is great. And we're in the process of assay validation and tech transfer between Uganda. The samples are going to be sent next week. We've also set up a collaboration with the general population cohort in Uganda, which is now collecting weekly samples for SARS-CoV-2 testing from a community of 20,000 people. And we're going to do a case control study evaluating the prevalence of pre-existing coronavirus infections in people with and without SARS-CoV-2 now. And then excitingly, through the EDCTP networking, we are now collaborating with Andreas Moore, and we obtained funding through the Botner Foundation to compare COVID antibody repertoires in infection and vaccination. And for this, we're going to focus on some special populations, including people with HIV who have low CD4 counts. Work package two is the Ex Vivo Challenge model, where we're going to set up um, the Ex Vivo Challenge model using oral and nasal biopsies taken from groups of healthy volunteers and infect the samples with SARS-CoV-2 in the lab and establish um, whether an infection has been established. So part one of this is to set up validation of the model and then, and then we will proceed to the study. So far, we've developed the lab manual. We've done ex vivo challenge training of the staff in Johannesburg and we've cultured viruses from both the South African variants and the UK variants. We've had some ethics delays about the part two groups. So we are starting with the validation phase with tissue resected during planned procedures to set up validation of the study and that's starting soon. The social science work package is going well. To date, we've done nine focus groups, 45. Uh, we're starting the, the interviews and we are currently doing a survey of 1,500 people amongst the general population cohort in rural Uganda. We're planning to do two workshops in April. Times have changed in Uganda and they've got rapid access to the AstraZeneca vaccine study. So not only are we focusing on people's attitudes to participating in vaccine trials, we're also focusing on rollout of vaccines within Uganda. And we're gonna look at healthcare workers and the general population. Healthcare workers vaccination is starting off now. So in terms of publications and comms, we've done a lot of networking. Our work packages are working very well together. Indeed, we've developed projects between the work packages, which we hadn't originally foreseen. We've linked up with the general population cohort in Uganda, and we've expanded the network and submitted a COVID networking grant to UK and we should hear about that in the next few weeks. We had a presentation at Croy by Katie Dawes this year, and the manuscript for that work has been submitted for publication. For this session, I just wanted to highlight the special populations we're, we're, we're focusing on. One is HIV positive people in the ex vivo challenge model to look at susceptibility. And we're also going to look at vaccine responses in people with HIV with low CD4 counts as vaccine studies to date have focused on people with a CD4 count above 200. We're also looking to test emerging products using the ex vivo challenge model in work package two. And as I said, we're expanding the social science work to look at public engagement for vaccine rollout as well as vaccine trials. 
And I must say that it's been a great working with the COVAB group. We're working extremely well together and I'd like to thank EDCTP for the opportunity to do this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. And again, thank you so much for managing your time really well. So uh, now we are going to move on to the panel and uh, I will request the panelists to join. And I will again request you to turn on your videos as we start off the panel discussion. On the panel today, we have uh, Katsi, who has made a presentation already in this session. We have Till and Julie. And to this list, I want to add Dawit, Achil, and Jenal. Uh, I'll be asking you some questions to respond. But before I do that, I would want to, I would request the three panelists who haven't uh, presented before to introduce themselves and I'll call them up. So David, please uh, introduce yourself briefly, but also talk about the work your consortium is doing. And I think within one minute, you're able to do that. So David, over to you, please. Okay, thank you, Juliet. I'm Dawit from Ethiopia. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the project, Profile Cove. We're trying to uh, understand the immune profile of our Ethiopian patients uh, who with chronic persistent immune activation. Our consortium consists of Macaulay University, uh, the Ethiopian Public Health Institute, the London School of Tropical Medicine, Amsterdam Institute of Global Health and Amsterdam uh, Medical Center in the Netherlands. Okay, um, thank you so much. And uh, to all panelists, uh, just to again remind that uh, please refer to the scientific names of the variants, not South African or UK variants. And uh, there's a publication to that effect that is discouraging that approach. So please keep this at the back of your mind as you make your intervention. Now, I want to invite the next panelists to just introduce themselves. And uh, actually, please, over to you. Uh, introduce yourself and also a brief about what your consortium is doing. Over to you, please. Uh, yes, uh, do we have a chill or in the meeting? If not, let me go on to Janelle, please. Yes, hi. Hi, till here. No, no, uh, I, I, maybe the pronunciation, pronunciation is I, I chill from the Strisco Consortium. Are you in the <laughs> meeting? If not, let's have Janelle from the Radiates Consortium introducing yourself and a brief about what your consortium does. Over to you. Good day, everyone. My name is um, Janelle Beeman, and I'm the coordinator of the Radiates Consortium. Um, our project is really broken up into two main focuses, the first of which is the development of a um, RT lamp assay that can be used as a point of care diagnostic. Um, and then the second is more focused on whole genome sequencing and really um, using whole genome sequencing as a molecular to look at differences in spread of SARS-CoV-2 in high-density and low-density population. Okay, thank you so much. Then I will go on to uh, present some questions that I would request panelists to respond to. And uh, the first question is, are children and pregnant women adequately represented in the current COVID-19 research studies? And uh, David, if I may start with you, your views on that, whether children and whether children and pregnant women are adequately represented in the current COVID-19 research studies. So David, please, your comments on that. Over to you. Thank you, Juliet. Uh, uh, many, uh, many of the projects related to COVID-19 uh, are involving pregnant women, but I, uh, we have seen several publications uh, neglecting children. Uh, I don't know the reason for this, but maybe because of the low prevalence uh, among them, 
or less being less severe among children, uh, there, there appears to be that children are really neglected. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dawit. And uh, Janal, your comments on that, please. Um, I can speak to the, the experience here in South Africa. Um, I think we have quite a number of studies that are currently on, ongoing, um, coordinated um, in large part by the South African Medical Research Council, um, which are looking really uh, mostly at um, the MIS-C infections in, in, in children or the MIS-C complications in children. Um, um, and also, you know, more, more hospitalized pediatric cases. Um, but I think, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, your audio is not very clear. On looking at so um, go on, please. In pregnant woman, I think there's a, a lot of um, research. that um, I can speak to the experience here in South Africa, um, where we have quite a number of studies focused on research um, in hospitalized children um, who've been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and these studies are largely focused on the MIS-C complications. Um, I'm actually involved in one of those studies, which is specifically looking at the antibody responses in these children, um, investigating both the neutralizing antibody responses, the binding antibody responses, and then FC effector mediated functions um, that might be um, extenu extenuating the disease um, outcomes in these kids. Um, in addition, there are multiple studies um, currently being driven by the South African Medical Research Council um, investigating in more detail more of the clinical outcomes um, in hospitalized children. However, I would say there is um, some lacking in terms of research studies in pregnant women, and potentially this is hampered by um, ethical considerations and limitations. Thank you so much, Jinal. Uh, 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 now, uh, Till, I'll turn to you to give your comments on that. But alongside that, I think there was a question in the Q&A, uh, which I think was for you, uh, which serological tests will be used. So when you're giving your comments on whether children and women, pregnant women and children are adequately represented also, please respond to that. So uh, Till, over to you, please. Yeah, we've been going back and forth on the precise serological test to start with us and with uh, that, and I will let um, Joy um, present our current decisions and sourcing and so forth. Um, I must admit that I don't have it in my head, but um, we do have, of course, in the team that information. It's a, it's a great question, and we had many, actually, discussions and uh, um, decisions to make on this point, um, and we've taken the ones that were right um, at this moment. Um, so regarding pregnant women and children or more broadly vulnerable populations, so what I would see as a research vision, maybe even for this consortium, um, many of the EDCDP funded studies, um, clearly the cases um, that we see in these studies such as ours will be few on the pregnant women side. And we should really consider pooling data across many studies to have sufficient power, right, to um, examine research questions and test hypotheses. Um, in our own study, um, we will not um, have sufficient numbers for more than an occasional description. Um, it will not be um, sufficient to make major um, yeah, to pursue major research questions for children. Um, in our own study, we have uh, children included. So there is an opportunity here to um, examine children. But again, I think for particular vulnerable groups, questions, pooling is a wonderful idea. And EDCDP um, should, sorry for the normative claim, um, put a bit of funding behind us getting together and sharing freely data. I really strongly believe in that um, for um, studies that the individual studies are fully underpowered, but jointly we can, um, we can discover um, um, new findings. Um, and 
in that, what I would also yep. find almost even more important from a social epidemiological per perspective or so notions of fairness and equity expressing themselves in inequality, um, we are, of course, concerned about the most vulnerable in a sense of also the poorest. Um, there is a notion of equity connected to age, of course. Um, there is deeply something about gender, and those are in pregnant women and children, but also amongst children, we care about the poorest children, the resource poorest children most, and um, then we need even more power, right, to see gradients in um, when it is about healthcare utilization, access to COVID-19 testing, access to vaccinations now, um, I think there is a whole agenda emerging um, that individually we often will not have sufficient data to see, for instance, socioeconomic gradients in access to vaccination amongst children, but jointly we could um, gain powerful understandings. Thank you so much. Thank you, Till. And now I want to turn to Katsi uh, to hear your views on this issue, please. Uh, the representation of children and pregnant women in COVID research studies. Katsi, please. Hello, Katsi, are you still in the meeting? Okay, perhaps we, we move on. Um, there's another question that again, we would want to hear your views. Uh, uh, are there other special population groups to consider in the context of COVID? And I think till you touched on some of those, I want to start with you now. Uh, you touched on the issue of socioeconomic, the poor, but are there other special population groups? And again, through the session, we've talked of HIV positive, but are there any other considerations? And again, too, there's another question. Uh, this question is from uh, Julie to you. Uh, do any of the DBS work use self-sampling? So I think as you make your comment to the panel question, also respond to this question that has been put to you. Until again, I start with you, over to you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and. I'm probably just stating the obvious, but those people most vulnerable to suffer severe consequences from COVID-19. And clearly we have learned a lot about risk factors. There are still new insights emerging in large epi studies, um, but we know it is older people. It is um, people with high BMIs and comorbidities, um, diabetes and lung disease. Um, so, of course, it is really interesting here from a health systems research per perspective. Um, and the starting point here is knowledge and also sentiment, attitudes, how people think about testing, how people think about, feel about, are informed about vaccination. Um, so the particular populations um, that are at risk of suffering the most severe consequences of COVID-19 um, should of course in the health system be prioritized. I think that's um, sort of an ethical stance we could all um, agree on. And now to measure, right, um, the distribution of um, um, risk and the access to services for COVID-19 um, by those risk factors of severe complications of COVID-19, such as old age, male, gender, um, Comorbidities, diabetes, lung disease, and high BMI, of course. Um, and Joy, sorry to call you in, but I think I haven't seen it. There's another question on a technical aspect that I think you are much better placed than I am to answer. I will also look it up, but Joy, if you could come in and um, respond to the um, question about our tests. Thank you very much. Um, so concerning the dried blood spots, uh, we are not using self-sampling. Oh, self-sampling, yeah, good, yeah. I, I see it. Yeah. yeah, we will still have the community health workers who will go uh, to the households and also our research nurses who will go to the uh, households to collect the dried uh, blood spots. 
And as yes, like you mentioned, for the earlier question on serology studying, uh, we are still um, uh, contemplating because there were some new rules that were uh, from the government of South Africa. So we have to wait on what they will uh, agree on so that we can be able to adopt it. I thank believe you. those were the two answers. Yes, two questions. Yes, thank you so much. So now I want to turn to Jenal. Uh, uh, please make your comment on whether you feel there are other special population groups that need, we need to consider in the context of COVID-19. Thank you. Um, I actually share many of the sentiments of uh, Till, um, but I, I think I would like to probably highlight that some of the special populations we need to focus on are those, especially in um, low to middle income countries who have uh, limited access to care. Um, I think there's still a lot um, going on in those communities that we are not picking up and that we're not aware of. Um, and then I also think an important population that needs to be studied Yes, Janelle, we've lost you. Probably on a global scale, um, who don't have comorbidities, but who still end up with. Sorry, am I going to hear me again? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Go on, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please. Can go you hear on. me? Yes, Janelle, we hear you. Please go on. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I was saying uh, the second uh, kind of uh, key population I think that we should be focusing on globally um, is the, the, the age group 25 to 40 years old um, who don't have com com comorbidities but who still end up um, with severe COVID. I think there's still a lot to be understood in terms of the pathogenesis um, in that age group. And I think, yeah, future studies should hopefully focus on that group as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janelle. Now I want to turn to Dawit uh, and you will comment on the special populations, but I would want to add something to your submission on how you think we can reach these, spe these special populations. You may highlight them, but also your ideas on how you think we can reach them. Over to you, Dawit. Yeah, uh, thank you, Juliet. Uh, I want to add also on the special population, which is actually uh, part of our uh, Profile of project, you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, apparently healthy HIV-negative individuals they have underlying chronic immune activation, persistent chronic immune activation, uh, which which results into immune dysfunctions. For example, in our scenario in the Ethiopian population, our CD4 count among the normal population is very low. You know, it's in the range of 700 cells, uh, you know, which is like 400 deficient compared to Europeans. That's why we are trying to understand uh, the impact of COVID-19 among Ethiopians versus Europeans. For example, we comparing uh, immune profile studies, response to antibodies and the other cellular biomarkers, Ethiopians versus uh, UK people living in Liverpool, for example. Uh, as mentioned earlier, one of the most important immune suppression in Africa is HIV AIDS. I hope it will be dealt tomorrow. But we, we just published a paper in International Journal of Infectious Disease from our cohort involving 2,617 showing that HIV increases risk of severe COVID by 4.2 fold. And this is one of... Uh, the newest reports, it has only been reported in South Africa. Uh, now, given the fact that there is chronic immune activation in Ethiopia related to helminthic infection, there is a debate going on, you know, co-infection with helminths, whether it aggravates uh, COVID-19 severity or whether it mutes. Uh, we just also published on this, we have preliminary data on to, as a preprint and we're going to profile immune response in terms of antibody response, cellular immune response, I, as I mentioned. This will have impact on diagnostics because uh, a few paper come from showing data from Zambia compared to European uh, cohorts where 
pre-COVID samples show a lot of false positive reactivity to rapid diagnostic tests. I think this is going to be uh, dealt uh, seriously because previous uh, uh, COVID, other coronavirus related uh, diseases might impact on serology. This will also impact on vaccine and also uh, we don't know the variants also. In addition, you know, we have a lot of other immune suppressed patients, like we have seen a lot of severe cases of COVID-19 with cancer patients, those also surgical cases and trauma cases, which need special attention. The other important one is age related risk, even in Africa, age is an important factor for severe COVID-19 because it is related with, you know, immunosenescence and inflammation and suboptimal vaccine efficacy might pose a problem here also. We don't know that we need to understand. Other special groups that deserve special attention are neuropsychiatric patients, those who are in correction facilities, disabled uh, patients with special needs, displaced populations and refugees, and more importantly, we forget about ourselves, healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. Because there is an assumption that because of the repeated exposure that healthcare workers are at increased risk of acquiring severe form of COVID-19. Reinfection is a problem. We just documented in our, co in our case uh, for the infection cases of which two were healthcare workers. They had had reinfection after three months. They appeared in the first episode of asymptomatic cases, in the second episode, they came with critical COVID-19. So all these are concerns of populations. How to reach them? First, we have to identify them. And really we need to work with policy makers and try to do surveillance, uh, other uh, treatment management issues related to such specific cases. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dawit. Um, Katsi, uh, uh, she's online now. So may I invite you to make a comment on this issue, the special populations, how to reach them. Uh, and a few issues came up why maybe they are left behind, but uh, let's get your perspective, please. Katsi, over to you. Thank you. Yes. So obviously slightly biased, but um, the pregnant population I think are, are being left behind. So they've been left out of numerous treatment trials in the early days. Um, there's still so much debate about vaccine safety now that the vaccines are being rolled out. Um, and there's a lot of anxiety, certainly in, in our populations about um, safely going to hospital to attend antenatal care, um, safely giving birth in hospitals. And I think there's a huge danger that we're going to move backwards with the um, sustainable development goals if um, we don't tackle those now. And I think that's that's the real um, downfall of, of the pandemic, both from the direct effect and the indirect effects of the lockdown. You know, these women have not been able to get to antenatal care because a lot of critical services, certainly in Uganda, were closed for many weeks. Um, and we're beginning to see the knock on of that now. Um, so I think we, we lose them at our peril. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we lost Julie. Julie, are you back? Yes, I'm here. Okay, please. Um, please make your comment. Yes, on this. So, so I think the special populations are, as you, as you said, HIV positive people with a CD4 count less than 200. They haven't been included in the vaccine trials, and they those are the, are the proportion the portion of HIV positive people who have the worst outcomes. Pregnancy, as um, we said, is important to get the the data, but also to get the safety data to reduce stigma because it's a barrier to vaccine uptake with such lack of data about vaccine safety in pregnancy. Cancer is a subpopulation. There was a press release yesterday by Adrian Hayday's group saying the immunogenicity of the Pfizer vaccine was less in a cancer population. And what that means is we don't have any idea about the vaccine interval in cancer populations or whether there's any difference between vaccines. And I think that's gonna be relevant for all special groups. 
that we won't know if the interval between certain groups, diabetes, HIV is the same for all special populations. The point earlier about getting large data, I think is very important, particularly if those large data sets have HLA type in it, so you can look at genetics as well. And the other group we haven't mentioned so far, we mentioned once I think was um, BMI, obesity. It's such a growing concern for so many multiple comorbidities. And this SARS-CoV-2 might be an opportunity to address obesity in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in that, I don't know how to do it. Um, and the other thing about special populations are, we don't understand quite currently who are the special populations that are more at risk of long COVID. And I think that's would be specific, more unknown outside the sort of European setting. So within an EDCTP funding situation, I think that would be very interesting to explore. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, there's a comment from uh, one of the panelists that uh, um, can we categorize healthcare workers and other essential professions such as teachers and police as frontline workers? And I think this is a fair submission, but of course also the, the, the issue of uh, the interventions being available for them, the vaccines being available for them, I think that's a challenge. But uh, perhaps Dawit, uh, especially, let me hear from you on that comment. How feasible is it, uh, given constrained systems, given limited uh, supplies? Can we take that perspective, which is different from the guidance that is being to give, given to countries now, especially in uh, the first group of people who will access the vaccine? Dawit, please. Hello, Dawit, are you on the, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm uh, on, uh, Juliet. Yeah, I agree with you, Juliet. Frontline uh, workers, like police teachers, uh, are very important, but uh, what can we do with, uh, with what we have? We, can, we have to do to take care of the healthcare workers initially, and then later on, we can move on them. But uh, I believe there are uh, frontline uh, workers, uh, uh, even in our country, bankers, for example, you know, when, when you go to the banks, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, like Ethiopia, we, we still we use cash. And so everybody goes to the bank to get money. Still, uh, you know, we use the, the cash for, 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 for purchase of uh, things and so on. Then uh, these credit cards are still uh, on the way and the mobile is not still on the way. So bankers are also frontline workers for us. So such because we're seeing a lot of cases among bank workers that are heavily exposed. Uh, so these are uh, uh, the things. Julie, this is a challenge for perhaps low middle income countries. Do you think it would be easier for high income countries to broaden the scope of who we categorize as frontline health workers and ensure that they have access to vaccine and services? Your comment on that, please. Yes, it was just striking me that um, frontline workers and those most at risk vary between countries a lot. Um, mm -hmm. There can be a one rule fits all. Um, certainly in the UK, bankers are not at risk at all. Um, so that was very interesting to hear. And I think that's where active surveillance comes in to be able to react to what the local population need is. I'm very interested to hear that. Um, okay, thank you so much. And yes, Julie, go on. I should say, I'm, I'm interested to hear if, if, if the risk factors are similar across different countries that we're talking about. I think that was in Ethiopia, was it? Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, in Kenya, well, yeah, other country is, is bankers a, a risk group there? Okay, let me turn to Katsi because you're doing research in Uganda, Kenya, Malawi, the Gambia, Mozambique. What do you see? Uh, what's your comment on that, please? Uh, Katsi, you're on mute. There we go. 
Uh, yes, it's really interesting, actually. Um, bankers have been um, classed as essential workers in Uganda for exactly the same reason that Dawood was saying in Ethiopia. Everybody is paid in cash. And if they can't get the cash out for their weekly wage from the bank, then they're not able to go to the market to buy food to provide for their family. So um, I think that's probably why um, bankers are considered um, critical workers here. I can't speak to the other countries. I would defer to my colleagues who are actually working there at the moment. Um, I think for teachers as well, it's less, I suppose the, the issue with teachers is trying to get the schools back to back to work, isn't it? And getting children back to school, because we know the enormous impact that, chil that having children at home over this past year has had uh, on mental and physical well-being and also on child growth and development. So if vaccinating teachers means that we can open the schools again, uh, both because it gives the teachers the um, uh, that sort of safety blanket that they need to know that they can safely go into a school where there might be children who are asymptomatically carrying the COVID virus and they won't get ill, but also to keep the classes running so that there's not a lot of staff sickness. And I think for that reason, that's really important. Um, for the rest, not really sure. Thank you so much. And uh, um, Jenal, Gen I would request your comment on that because in Africa, I think South Africa is uh, one of the countries that has maybe has gained mileage in rolling out the vaccine. Um, who is frontline health, uh, frontline worker? Is there room to expand the scope of that definition? Jenal, please. Um, so, yeah, so definitely at the moment where we've only, um, you know, rolled out the phase 3B trial to actual healthcare workers, um, um, but our elderly have been prioritized actually, you know, subsequent to healthcare workers. So, you know, once we have enough um, vaccine uh, stock, um, the elderly will be prioritized first. And then, the, yeah, definitely that will be followed by um, uh, teachers, uh, workers who come into contact with uh, many people. So, for example, those at the shops, um, the cashiers at the shops, uh, and and I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure if bankers fall under the same category because in South Africa, you know, we we don't use a cash based system um, as our main form of um, of money. But having said that, you know, um, people at banks are probably as exposed. Um, the workers at banks are probably as exposed as shares at the grocery store, for example. So definitely, those people are being considered, but. Um, sort of as second priority to to the elderly and to those with co comorbidities as well. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, presenters. Thank you so much panelists. Now uh, allow me to highlight key messages from our discussion. One that is so strong is the concept of leave no one behind. We are talking about universal health coverage. We are talking about leave no one behind in research processes access to vaccine and uh, service delivery. Now, how do we reach key populations that are potentially more vulnerable to COVID? We've talked about issues of ethical, especially when it comes to pregnant women, attitude, hesitancy, stigma. We need to identify them. We need tailored approaches. We need context specific definitions, but also noting that uh, this is costly, you know? We know the projected reduction in economic growth uh, given the COVID pandemic and also reaching these special populations being a costly process because the tailored method models sometimes are costly. So this is something we need to keep discussing. Uh, the issue of uh, HIV low CD4 count and uh, being more vulnerable to severe COVID, but also we know the disrup disruption of health services that many countries have experienced. People with non-communicable diseases have missed their doses. We need to also pay attention to that. Alongside research processes, we need to ensure continuity of essential services. Uh, the issue of community engagement, this is an old discussion, but we are, net, we are yet to nail it. You know, we've learned, we learned so much from the days of Ebola. We keep learning so much from the so many disease outbreaks, but we are still struggling to really 
foster behavioral change at an individual level, you know, engaging communities in a more meaningful and effective way. The issue of pulling studies, uh, uh, pulling results across studies uh, to generate meaningful samples that can give uh, robust evidence to guide decision making. Uh, sustainable capacity, laboratory capacity. I think uh, Professor Antoni talked about taking samples, but even in this uh, panel, there was a presentation that sample, some of the samples were tested in Australia. So sustainable laboratory capacity in Africa to really uh, support research, but also support service delivery. So uh, these are the few things I'll summarize uh, from our session. The issue of multi-sector response, you know, we didn't talk much about this, but I think uh, uh, leaving no one behind will take more than the health sector. So again, we need to pay attention that even in research processes, bringing in other sectors who can help us implement the recommendations from these studies. So again, I want to thank you so much for the very fruitful and uh, productive discussion. And now I'll invite Pauline and Tom to wrap up and then they will close our session. So Pauline and Tom, over to you. Thank you, Juliet. Um, I think we also have Tom on the line. Perhaps, first of all, I can see a hand up from Till. I don't know if that's from previous whether he wants to add anything. Oh, hi. Oh, okay, um, Sorry, please go on. Comment. Um, and it was just a meta observation that um, in our um, 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 ideating about missing research data and under-researched areas of special populations, we had a range of different dimensions of special, right? We had social roles, we had um, social ideas, right? Uh, no one left behind and resource poor populations. And then we had the biologically vulnerable. And I just wanted to highlight um, that we had these different dimensions of special and in a sense from very different research perspectives, all important, but important in different ways and also re requiring clearly um, different research agendas and research methods. That was just a comment I had wanted to make. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks very much. I think that was a very good summary. I have to say, um, I think Juliet has done a fantastic job in uh, summing up and uh, there's not much else that needs to be said. I think, first of all, I'd just like to thank the speakers, the, the chairs, the panelists and all the attendees for giving their time to this session which certainly I have found uh, really fantastic and interesting. I think also um, EDCTP is really uh, pleased with the, the projects that we have funded here, I think, which really speak to EDCTP's focus also on so-called special populations. And also, I think it seems that all of these projects really also are, are done in partnership and networking. I think from the first session, it was very gratifying to hear that there is good contact between the researchers and uh, the local authorities and ministries. And as Julia also said, that there, there is community engagement uh, going on. Um, but of course, this is always a work in progress, uh, not just in Africa, I think in every country at the moment uh, dealing with COVID. It was also uh, very good to hear the, the second session on special populations, I think as Till has very well summarized. And also um, as was raised that um, obviously COVID is, is proving disastrous in many ways, but it also seems to be increasing inequity. And this is also very uh, um, difficult to, to deal with in these times as well. And we are also noting the impact of COVID on all of our other projects um, uh, and obviously the impact on the population health. Um, we have another session tomorrow and we're going to be looking also at variants and other areas. But I, I think, I hope you will agree that there has been some really good points and discussions raised in this session. And we 
we hope to continue this series of webinars, bringing together really the EDCTP community of projects, but where possible, uh, linking with other groups and projects as well. So I think really I just want to close the session now and to thank everyone for their participation and to hope that you will uh, join us tomorrow for the next uh, session. And I'll stop there, maybe pass over to Jean-Marie. I think uh, Tom is not able to join us, although it appears he's here. If I've got that wrong, maybe he can speak out. But maybe I just pass over to Jean-Marie, who's organised the session, and to thank all my colleagues at EDCTP who've helped with the organisation. Over. Hi, thanks, Pauline. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think I don't have much to add. Tomorrow we'll continue with other two uh, sessions. We'll be covering COVID-19 and other major infectious diseases. We always said, for example, HIV, TB, malaria, but there may be some other cases, for example, in IDs, if we talk about the uh, what is prevalent in Africa. So that will be covered in session three, uh, which will start at uh, 1.45 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, and then the last session, session four, will be covering uh, new emerging questions. These are many. Some have been mentioned here today. It's long COVID, it's new variants, but also specifically when we talk about the knowledge gaps that are specific to Southern Africa. So that is uh, something which is very really important for us to see whether with these small investments we are missing some important knowledge gaps to be to be to be closed in the context of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that's it. Uh, the rest uh, I'll be following up with the chairs and speakers of tomorrow for specific uh, guidance. And I'd like to thank also the, the 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 attendees who were there all the afternoon with us. I hope to see you all tomorrow again. Thank you. <laughs>